Hello all, let's see the part 3 of the current affairs roundup for January to March 2023 of GS1. Uh, we'll continue from the last topic. Uh, we will see now about the Lavani dance. This was a news because a recently a noted Lavani dancer, her name is Megha Ghadge, she raised an issue of obscenity and vulgarity in the dance performances under the name of Lavani programs. So this makes a very interesting topic for UPSC and uh, we, will, uh, we will have to see what is this Lavani dance is all about. So it's a traditional folk art form from the state of Maharashtra with an aesthetical combination of singing, enactment and dance. So the word Lavani comes from Lavanya or beauty. It has attained particular popularity in the Peshwa era in the 18th century. So traditionally performances were held in front of kings and uh, for the entertainment of tired soldiers who are resting during the breaks in fighting. So there are several sub-genres of Lavani of which most popular is the Shrungaric or the erotic kind. So from the geography uh, part of the syllabus, we should also learn about this Western disturbances. It was a news because a fresh Western disturbance we simply addresses as uh, WD has recently hit the northern India for which authorities have forecasted modern rainfall and snowfall at higher altitudes. So this makes uh, Western disturbances a very important topic from your examination point of view. So Western disturb uh, disturbances is the term has been used to describe an extra tropical storm. Please understand this is an extra tropical storm. It brings sudden winter rain and snow to the northwestern parts of the Indian subcontinent. This is very important. The western disturbances is the extra tropical storm. It brings rains and uh, snow to the northwestern parts of Indian subcontinent, particularly near Uttarakhand, Rajasthan, and also in the Gujarat area. So this is mo non-monsoonal precipitation pattern and it is driven by the westerlies. Okay, it arises from the Mediterranean Sea, passes through the Caspian Sea, absorbs the moisture, travels to Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan and bring uh, rains and snowfall in the northwestern parts of the country. So this is non-monsoonal precipitation pattern and it is driven by the westerlies. The moisture in this uh, storms usually originates over the Mediterranean Sea as I showed here in the map and also the Atlantic Ocean. So extra tropical storms are global phenomena uh, with moisture usually carried in the upper atmosphere unlike the tropical storms where it is carried in the lower atmosphere. So please understand in the tropical cyclones the uh, the water vapor or whatever the moisture is there it is carrying in the upper atmosphere while these extra tropical or the western disturbances they will carry the moisture in the lower atmosphere. Okay, This is non-monsoonal precipitation and it gathers uh, the moisture from Mediterranean Sea and the Atlantic Ocean. So this western disturbance in, in, in India usually influence the weather on the north and the northwestern regions of India and it increases the monsoonal activity. So if you can remember during uh, the winter season there were before that there will be a retreating monsoon in the country. So there will be uh, the climate of retreatal uh, uh, monsoons and this will uh, this western disturbances will increase the monsoonal activities. Okay, And it was found that if the frequencies of formation and movement of depression over the Bay of Bengal in a particular year increases then the frequency of western disturbance of the same year will decrease. This point is very very important. Please understand if there is more and more number of depressions happening, happening in the Bay of Bengal region, then the number of dis western disturbances happening will be less. 
so please understand if here it is more there will be less number western disturbances but if cyclones in the bay of bengal is less then the western disturbances will be more some or the other way the climate of the indian subcontinent is balanced by the monsoonal tropical uh, cyclones and also the western disturbances so these western disturbances are very important to the development of rabi crop please uh remember the western disturbances are helpful for the rabi crop because it is in the northern subcontinent uh, they include the local important staple wheat so this western disturbances will come during the winter season and it is uh, helpful for the wheat please remember this uh, this is the way I, uh, one formula i had made to remember Uh, western disturbances will call will come during winter and it it will affect the western part of the country and very very important for the growth of wheat so www okay the next important topic we have to uh, see is this adi mahotsav adi means the tribes so it comes under the art and culture part of our syllabus it was a news because prime minister narendra modi ji has recently inaugurated this adi mahotsav in the major dhyan chand national stadium of delhi so what is this festival all about it is a national tribal festival it aims to showcase the tribal culture celebrate the spirit of tribal culture crafts cuisine and commerce and traditional art so it is an annual initiative of the tribal cooperative marketing development federation limited or trifed under the ministry of tribal affairs so shri hanna this is like uh, you know the millets shri hanna it is the indian term for millets since 2023 is being celebrated as the international year of millets a special focus in the mahotsav will be on showcasing shri anna which is uh, grown by the tribals so this shri anna is indianized uh, or the hindi or indian term for millets and 2023 is the international year of millets and in this adi mahotsav we are showcasing different cue sign made from the millets or shri anna so in the event nstftdc disseminate information on various schemes and financial support being powered to the scheduled tribes so mainly adi means it is tribes tribal festivals so nstfdc is the short form for national scheduled tribes finance and development corporation uh from the examination point of view it is important you have to read about this organization because since you are uh, since they are uh, disseminating the information here this become you also should uh, understand what is this organization all about so it was set up in the year 20, 2001 and it is under the ministry of tribal affairs it works for the socio economic and educational upliftment of scheduled tribes or the sts it also provides for the better self employment avenue so that they can become economically independent and self reliant it devises and implements the financial assistance scheme exclusive for the tribes the schemes are pro for providing loans to the poor scheduled tribes at concessional rates of interest and on on soft terms and conditions see you cannot impose the same rate of interest for these tribal people because you have to inspire them for the financial inclusion so they are going to provide in the softer terms uh, loan to this uh, tribal people for helping the tribal students to pursue higher education loans are offered which are subsidized by the ministry of human resources development please understand it is under the ministry of tribal affairs and was set up in 2001 and works for the socio economic educational upliftment of the scheduled tribes now this is very very important from women uh, related issues women 20 uh the it was a news because two day inception meet of women 20 was held at aurangabad district of maharashtra so women 20 is an official engagement group under the g20 so women 20 is under 
G20 official engagement group which is focusing on gender equity. So Women 20 was established during the Turkish presidency of G20 in 2015 and the priorities of this Women 20 is women's entrepreneurship, grassroots women leadership, bridging the gender digital divide, educational and skill development and also climate change. So the primary objective, the important primary objective is to ensure that gender considerations are mainstreamed into the G20 discussions and translated into G20 leaders declaration as policies and commitments. So these policies and commitments will foster the gender equality and women's economic empowerment. W20 or Women 20 under India's presidency is focused on actualizing Prime Minister's vision of women-led development. So there are five priority areas of W20 under the India's presidency which are women's entrepreneurship, grassroots women leadership, bridging the gender digital divide, educational and skill development and climate change. Next important topic is arts in monkey bath. You all know that Prime Minister is uh, doing this monkey bath and it's very popular. So uh, in this monkey bath, Prime Minister has spoken about Ustad Bismillah Khan Yuva Puraskar awards and their art forms. So the first uh, important art he spoke is about Sur Singar. It is a stringed musical instrument. It is similar to the Sarod. So it is a Hindustani musical instrument that is Sur Singar. It is very similar to Sarod, but it, uh, which is older and it produces deeper notes. The instrument is made of wood and has a gourd attached to a hollow wooden handle with a metal finger board. The strings of the instrument Sur Singar is usually four in number and made of brass or bronze it is plucked with a metal pick the sursingar can be played holding it vertically in front of the musician and supported by its left shoulder like the veena so it can be played holding it parallel to the ground like the sarod or like the siddhar which is held at an angle of 50 to 60 degree to the ground the Sur Singar usually accompanies Drupad, which is the genre of the Hindustani vocal music. Uh, Kolkata based multi instrumentalist Joydeep Mukherjee is credited with reviving Sur Singar along with another lost stringed instrument, the Radhika Mohanavina, named after its creator Radhika Mohana Maitra. So, it is a, basically a Hindustani musical instrument and it is very similar to Sarod, older and produces deeper notes. Uh, please uh, understand it is usually accompanied by Drupad uh, and it is a genre of the Hindustani vocal music. The next important art he has spoken is about mandolin. This is the mandolin. Uh, it is a stringed instrument. As you can see, there are strings attached. So it is a stringed instrument. It usually has four strings, uh, eight strings. Four strings is in Sur Singar. And uh, mandolin has eight strings that are plucked with a pick similar to a flute. Sorry, the F has been uh, F has been missed here. It is a flute. The mandolin is a moderately sized instrument. It is smaller than the veena, sitar or a guitar. It was developed in the Europe in 18th century as an evolution of the older mandola or the mandola. The greatest exponent of mandolin in Indian classical music was later late Uppa. Lapu Srinivas, often known as Mandolin Srinivas, who however used the electric instrument rather than the acoustic one. So Uppalapu Nagamani, a mandolin player, is the winner of Ustad Bismillah Khan Yuva Puraskar of 2021 for Carnatic Instrumental. So Karakatam and Perini Odyssey. It was uh, mentioned in Monkey Bath, so it becomes an important art and culture topic for you. Karagatam, which is seen in the picture, it is an ancient folk dance of the state of Tamil Nadu. Karagatam performers wear colorful saris and dance with a pot. See the pot here? This is called the Karakam on their head. 
the dance is performed to invoke mariamman mariamman is the rain goddess so v durga devi of salem is a well known karakattam dancer and she has won this award for karakattam the next one is perini odyssey perini natyam is a dance which is dedicated to lord shiva it is quite popular during the kakatiya dynasty so ram kumar nayak had organized perini odyssey which lasted for one out one days and 31 districts of telangana and he has won this uh, uh, ustad bismillah khan yuva puraskar for perini odyssey so you should also understand what is this ustad bismillah khan yuva puraskar so this ustad bismillah khan yuva puraskar was announced in the year 2006 and it is given to artists up to the age of 40 years by the sangeet natak academy so this organization sangeet natak academy which is the apex body for the performing arts in the country will give this ustad bismillah khan yuva puraskar and it was introduced in 2006 and artists up to the age of 40 years can win this award so it is going to identify and encourage outstanding young talents in the performing arts and give them national recognition early in their life so ustad bismillah khan yuva puraskar carries a purse money of rupees 25000 it will also carry an angavastram and a plague like this this is the uh, award plague next is the pushpagiri kshetram It is a 13th century Hindu temple ruins. It has been recently unearthed at the Pushpagiri Kshetram in Kadappa district. The Pushpagiri Kshetram hillock is also known as Pushpachala. This hillock is famous for the chain of temples which is dedicated to pantheon of Hindu gods. It has over 100 small and big temples in its vicinity. So Chennakeshwa Temple, Uma Maheshwara Temple, Rudra Pada Temple, Vishnu Pada Temple, Trikoot Eshwara Temple, Vaidyanath Eshwara Temple, Subramanya Temple, Vigneshwara and Durga Devi Temples are found here in the Pushpagiri Kshetra. So here a very important river, Penna River. Please, uh, please read uh, Penna about this Penna River of which river's tributary uh, it is, and it is flow flowing in the southwest of the Pushpagiri. Pushpagiri is referred to as Hariharak Kshetra as there are number of temples dedicated to both Shiva and Vishnu the architectural features of the ruins reveal a style which is contemporary to a temple at Vallur the Vallur temple was built by the Kayastha rulers of the 13th century AD the Kayasthas were the subordinates to the rulers of Kakatiya dynasty see this is in Andhra Pradesh so obviously Andhra and Telangana was mainly ruled by this Kakatiya dynasty so these Kayastha rulers were the subordinates of this Kakatiya dynasty they ruled the region with Vallur as their capital the next important news was about this chatrapati uh, sambhaji nagar aurangabad we just mentioned about the w20 organized here and now this aurangabad which is in maharashtra has been recently rechristened as chatrapati sambhaji nagar uh, aurangabad's history incorporates the sultanate mughals and the marathas and goes back further in time so ajanta elora uh, uh, caves are in aurangabad Ajanta has 30 rock cut Buddhist monuments from the 2nd century BC. Ellora is the largest rock cut Hindu temple and its 100 caves dating back to the Rashtrakuta and the Yadava dynasties. Ajanta Ellora caves are UNESCO World Heritage sites which are in Aurangabad. So please understand this uh, city has been uh, being rechristened as Chhatrapati Shambhaji Nagar. and uh, this aurangabad uh, history has many rulers in its uh, history that is sultanate moguls mo marathas ruling them and mohammed bin tughlaq a sultan of delhi sultanate shifted to decided to shift his capital to safer daulatabad or deogir but failed to do so the fort in daulatabad was capital of the yadava dynasty till the 14th century it later became a part of the ahmedanagar sultanate the tomb of mughal emperor aurangzeb uh, lies in aurangabad aurangzeb's wife dilras banu begum's burial mausoleum it is known as bibi ka maqbara it is also called as puwaman's taj mahal it also is in aurangabad it was built by aurangzeb and uh, it is known as the taj of the deccan or the puwaman's taj mahal 
because he was uh, believing in the quran and quran doesn't uh, promote much much um, uh, much into the architecture so aurangabad was rechristened after sambhaji sambhaji was a maratha ruler chhatrapati shivaji's son and the city also hosts the well known shivaji museum the next important to- topic about women and history is chennar revolt so this is the bicentenary celebration of uh, this chennar revolt and it's very very important topic from your examination point of view the bicentenary celebration of one of the earliest recorded anti caste assertions in the southern india was held in nagar koil with the attendance of chief ministers of kerala and tamil nadu so this anti caste revolt fought in 1823 in the southern parts of travancore kingdom is known as maru marakkal samaram and chenna revolt in kerala and tol silai poratam in uh, tamil nadu tol silai means it's a blouse poratam so the revolt is a militant public action sought with the women from the nadar caste the nadar caste are obc community in the forefront uh, they are uh, majorly seen in kerala and tamil nadu regions the demand was that they should be allowed to clothe the upper part of their body a choice then limited to the upper caste women so in the parts of tamil nadu and kerala women were not allowed to uh, cover their upper parts of their body and this choice of covering the upper part of the body was limited only to the upper caste women like the brahmans so these nadar who are the uh, obc community they had no right uh, they they could not cover their upper body so hence this chenna revolt is also known as the upper cloth revolt as i told you tol silai miss means the upper cloth or the blouse revolt so the agitation spread across the southern talukas of the then travancore kingdom the hindu upper caste particularly the nayar community dominated the administration they opposed this demand of wearing the upper cloth uh, the royal proclamation acceding the demand was made in 1859 the vaikum satyagraha 1924 to 25 was held uh, to allow all caste access to roads when uh, past the vaikum shiva temple and this Va- vaikum satyagraha saw the participation of hindu upper caste in large numbers there was a savarna ma- march organized from vaikum to thiruvananthapuram to press the demand of the satyagrahis please remember this man's name that is shri narayana guru who was behind this vaikum satyagraha he fought against the caste system for social equality so his message was man is of one kind one faith and one god vaikuntha swami who was born in the nadar family started a radical spiritual movement which wanted equality at its core it was influenced by tamil siddha tradition vaikuntha swami challenge uh, the custodians of the caste and religious pure is maintained and questioned all sets of authority the guruvayur uh, temple entry movement in 1931 uh, allowed entry to socially backward hindus next topic is about humayun because there was a book release uh, about humayun the book was named the planetary king so historian eba kosh book the planetary king humayun pacha inventor and visionary on the mughal throne was launched in delhi on humayun's birth anniversary so you should know about humayun he was his birth name was nasiruddin humayun he ruled between 1530 to 1540 and 1555 to 56 he was the second mughal padsha he was the successor of babur the founder of mughal dynasty and father of akbar humayun's means humayun name means lucky but uh, he was quite unlucky actually uh, he could rule only he had uh, very difficult years um uh, between 40 and 55 uh, he was uh, replaced by shesha suri and again he had to claim back so he lost his rival uh, to his rival shesha suri in the battle of chausa in 1539 and again in the battle of uh, kanauj in 1540 which made him to flee to iran in iran humayun received help from safavid uh, shah and regained his throne in delhi in 1555 after f- uh, 15 years of losing the battle a year later in 1556 he died in an accident so his biography is kanun e umayuni was written by historian kawaud amir it is also known as umayun nama of kwada mir humayun nama is an account of his life written by his sister gulbadan begum during akbar's reign 
Shahjahan's court poet Abu Talib Khalim Khashani wrote a poem on Humayun's tomb. Um, Akbar erected this Humayun's tomb, which is in Delhi. Uh, it is near the Purana Kila, which we read about. Uh, the visitors of G20 delegates will be visiting there. It is also called Pandavunka Kila. Uh, the palace fortress and other Mughal buildings. Umayun had immense knowledge and interest in astronomy and astrology. Uh, so Umayun himself wrote scientific treaties on including an introduction to the science of astronomy and some other unusual matters. Umayun even planned to construct an observatory in India. So the next important topic is about holy colors. Holy colors. Holy has lead oxide, copper sulfate and malachite green and aluminium bromide, Prussian blue, chromium iodide, genetian violet and uh, mercury sulfide. So Holi is a harvest festival which is celebrated by playing with colors. It comes during summer. Uh, traditionally natural gulal or color is made from dried flower petals, vegetable dyes, starch, leaves etc. Natural holy gulals are made with turmeric or henna flowers such as marigold, chrysanthemum and rose. They also have ingredients like gram flour or rice flour. Food grade colors are also used in making colors which are synthetic. The dry colors commonly known as gulals or abhir have two components that is colorant and a base. The dry color may, be cutane, may cause cutaneous problems because they have these uh, chemicals. Please remember these chemicals. The chemicals in the synthetic colors can harm skin, respiratory tract and eyes. They can also harm the environment which is adding the particulate ma matter to the air. Uh, these particulate matter cause ocular infections and breathing trouble and these chemicals take years to decompose. Please remember all these uh, chemicals and their impact. Next topic is Keeladi Museum. Uh, it was in news because the Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu inaugurated this Keeladi Museum in Shivaganga district of Tamil Nadu. This museum is built on two acres of Keeladi at a cost of Rs 18.43 crore. So this museum is located 12 kilometers southeast of Madurai city in Shivaganga district and has six blocks and is built in Chettinad style of architecture. So this museum is adorned with 15,000 unique artifacts which was unearthed between the 4th and 8th phases of excavation since 2018. The information on every piece of display will be available in two languages and is accompanied by a catalogue of Braille. So this is equipped with multimedia content, QR codes and holograms. It uh, houses a replica of the excavation trench and a play area. The hamlet, so you should know what is this. Uh, why is this Kiladi very very important? This is a hamlet uh, which has a major urban habitation site unlike many other archaeological sites in the state. Kiladi excavations began in the year 2015. From then it is making a lot of noise. Uh, the, the, it is a testimony to the regal life lived by the ancient Tamils during the Sangam age. The first three seasons of excavations were carried out between 2014 and 17 by the Archaeological Survey of India. The Tamil Nadu State Government of Archaeology took over from the fourth season in 2018. So the State Archaeological Department is about to begin the ninth phase of excavations. So this Yaoshang festival, it is uh, in news because this five day long Yaoshang festival is Manipur's version of Oli and it has begun this year. This fe festival is celebrated every year on the full moon day of the Lamtha month that is February and March of the Mithi lunar calendar. It is celebrated by the Mithi people who are predominantly Hindu and these Mithi people are the valley people. So it is celebrated at the same time as Holi and it is known as Manipu's version of Holi. The festival marks the rejuvenation of the spirit of life and commemorates the birthday of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The, on the first day, Yao Shang, a small thatch hut or straw hut. See here, see here, this is a straw hut. It is constructed with bamboo and straws. The image of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the thatched hut is worshipped. After the sunset, the festival bega begins with Yaoshang Methaba. It is also known as burning of this straw hut. So morning they are building this and evening they are going to burn the straw hut. Children visit neighbors to ask for monetary donations called Nakha Thang. During these five days, sporting events happen during the day and traditional. Tabal Chongba dance will be there in the nights. 
तो वॉट इज दिस चबाल चोंगा इट लिटरली मीन्स द फुल मून डांस अ ट्रेडिशनल डांस ऑफ द मीथी वेर बॉयज एंड गर्ल्स गैदर्ड इन एन ओपन ग्राउंड एंड डांस इन अ सर्कल now from geography end you have to read about the cyclone freddy uh, because it is it has dissipated over malawi in march 2023 after a record breaking 37 days stint over the southern indian ocean and africa this cyclone freddy was first developed off the north australian coast and tracked across the entire southern indian ocean it covered a total distance of more than 8000 km during its lifetime and periodically weakened below the tropical storm status The cyclone made landfall thrice once in Madagascar and twice in Mozambique. It records made by Cyclone Freddy are yet to be validated by the World Meteorological Organization. Actually it is the longest lived tropical cyclone ever recorded in any of the earth's oceans. This is very very important from your prelims point of view. It has lasted for 37 days and broke the record of 31 days which was set by the hurricane John in 1994. It also broke the record for the highest accumulated cyclone energy at 87.01 units breaking the record of 85.27 units by hurricane Lo Ayok in 2006. So cyclone Freddy is the first tropical cyclone ever to experience seven phases of rapid intensification over its lifetime. Previous it was four rapid intensification phases. so the accumulated uh, cyclone energy is the total wind energy generated by tropical cyclone throughout its lifetime and it is calculated as a square of peak wind spin observed calculated and added every 6 uh, hours so rapid intensification is when a tropical cyclone gains wind speeds of more than 55 kilometers per hour in a period of 24 hours The next topic is about Komaram Bheem and Alluri Sita Rama Raju because the Telugu movie RRR was inspired by the lives of this Indian freedom fighters Alluri Sita Rama Raju and Komaram Bheem. So both this Alluri Sita Rama Raju and Komara Komaram Bheem were 20th 20th century revolutionaries. They led this tribal people in the present day Andhra Pradesh against the British and also the Nizams. Uh, Alluri Sita Rama Raju is believed to have been born between uh, on 4th July of 1897 in a village called Moggalu near Bhimavaram in Andhra Pradesh. By the age of 18, he became a sannyasi, renouncing all world worldly pleasures and mingled with the local tribal community. These tribes called uh, followed the Podu system of cultivation. It is like shifting cultivation. Whereby every year some amounts of forest tracts were cleared for cultivation, just like our Uh, shifting cultivation the madras forest act of 1882 banned the collection of minor forest produce and tribal people were forced into labor by the colonial government it restricted the free movement of the tribal communities and prohibits them from engaging in the podu agricultural system this oppressive order was the beginning of the tribal revolt known as the manyam rebellion in august 1922 he launched this rampa rebellion against the british he used guerrilla warfare along with army of tribal people to fight against the british however on 7th may 1924 he was treacherously trapped tied to a tree and shot dead he was honored for valor and fiery spirit with the manyam virudu that is the uh, hero of the jungle and this was on 125th birth anniversary our prime minister unveiled a 30 feet bronze statue of him at bhimavaram in the west godavari district Uh, another important hero Komaram Bhim was born on October 22 1901 at Sanke Palli village in Asifabad he hailed from Gond tribal community Bhim's family migrated to Sardarpur village in Keri Meri mandal after the father's death Nizam's government used to collect tax in the name of Bambaram and Dupapetti for grazing cattle and collecting firewood in for cooking He led a rebellion against the Nizams of Hyderabad opposing the taxes the slogan Jal Jungle Jameen that is water forest land was given by Bhim to fight for tribal freedom and rights and oppose the taxes Komaram Bhim died in the battle against the Nizams army in Jode Ghat forest Asifabad district has been named as Komaram Bhim district since 2016 Next important topic is Sinia Island Uh, archaeological uh, archaeologists have found the oldest pearling town in the persian gulf 
on an island of one of the north shake dumps of the uae the perling town sits on sinia island whose name means flashing lights sinia island shields the core al bida marshlands and it is located north of um al kuam um al kuam is the least uh, populated emirate in the uae the perling town predates the rise of islam across the arabian peninsula and dates back to the late 6th century the archaeologists have already discovered an ancient christian monastery dating back to uh, 1400 years in the island the town sits directly south of that monastery on one of the curling fingers of the island and stretches across some 12 acres So archaeologists have found a variety of homes made of beech rock, lime mortar, ranging from crumpled quarters to more sprawling homes with a courtyard suggesting a social stratification. In the homes loose pearls and diving whites are also discovered. The site also be a sign of year-round habitation unlike other pearling operations run in seasonal spots in the region. The pearling industry rapidly collapsed after the World War 1 with the introduction of artificial pearls. The discarded oyster shells from the pearling industry is found in a dump site in the island. Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Sharjah, Ajman, Umm Al Quwain, Fujairah and Ras Al Khaima are seven emirates of UAE. Please remember this. Next topic is about Venusian volcano scientists said get first direct geological evidence of an active volcano in the venusian uh, surface a fresh analysis of radar images obtained more than 30 years ago has yielded new evidence indicating venus is current, currently volcanically active nasa's magellan spacecraft imaged portions of venus up to 3 times spanning 24 months from 1990 to 92 It shows that a volcanic vent about 1.6 km wide on the Venusian surface expanded and changed shape over a 8 month span in 1991. The Atla Rigo area of Venus is where two of the biggest volcanoes of Venus, Oza Mons and Mata Mons are located. The vent is situated on Mat Mons which is about 9 km tall and is the planet's highest volcano and second highest mountain. So it is the second planet which is closer to sun in the solar system diameter of venus is about 12000 km and it is slightly smaller than earth due to its size venus is often known as earth's twin it has thick atmosphere mainly of carbon dioxide which traps in heat in a runaway greenhouse effect the thick atmosphere make venus solar system's hottest planet venus lacks plate tectonics which is responsible of for most of the volcanoes on earth the first spacecraft that visited venus was the soviet union's venera series nasa has two mission missions for venus in the near future that is da vinci and veritas european space agency venus mission envision uh, japan's akatsuki spacecraft has been studying venus atmosphere since 2015 uh, venus mission of india is uh, shukrayaan 1 is expected to do, to be launched in december 2024 please read all these missions and the um, and the country associated because it can come in the form of match the following next is about mata sharda devi temple it was a news because union home minister and minister of cooperation e inaugurated this ma sharda devi temple at kupwara in jammu and kashmir sharda peet and sharda mata devi temple is a revered site for the hindu community in jammu and kashmir It is one of the 18 Maha Shakti Peethas and is considered to be the abode of Indian Indian Hindu goddess Saraswati. It is located in the Neelam Valley in Pakistan occupied Kashmir across Teethwal village in Kupwara district of uh, Jammu and Kashmir along the line of control. Ma Sharda's temple was reconstructed as the temple has been out of reach since partition. So originally there was no idol of the goddess Sharda in the temple but there was only a stone plinth. The reconstructed temple has the idol of Sharda Ma which was donated by the Shringeri Math. It's an important step in the direction of discovery of Sharda civilization and promotion of Sharda script. Sharda Peet has been a historical center of India's cultural, religious and educational heritage. It was a center of learning known as Sharda Peet or Sarvagnana Peet. 
So government of India is working in the direction of start of Sharda Peet Yatra across the line of control. So please remember the Sharda Peet is in, on the line of control in the Kupwara district of Jammu and Kashmir. So let's see about the Sharda script. The original script is from Kashmir. It evolved from the western branch of Brahmi nearly 1200 years ago. At this time, the language of Kashmir was developing into Kashmiri, but its peculiar intonations, variations and sounds and the script became unfit for Sanskrit. But almost all the ancient Sanskrit literature of Kashmir is written in this Sanskrit Sharda script. The Kartarpur corridor inaugurated in 2019 links two important six shrines and allows pilgrims to travel visa free. It links Dera Baba Nanak in Gurdaspur of Punjab and Gurdwara Darbar Sahib in Kartarpur of Pakistan. The next topic is about Mount Merapi. You can see here near the Java Sea in the Indian Ocean near Jakarta. The Indonesia's Merapi volcano spews hot clouds and ash in new eruption and halted tourism. Indonesia's Mount Merapi is one of the world's most active volcanoes. Mount Merapi volcano is located on the border of central Java and Yogyakarta provinces. It is 2,968-meter uh, uh, mountain about 30 kilometers from Yogyakarta. Mount Merapi is the most active among the 120 active volcanoes in Indonesia. You can see here, it is uh, too much active. You find the volcanic mountains in Indonesia. The volcano's last major eruption was in 2010 and killed more than 300 people. Despite being a dangerous volcano, Mount Merapi is a famous tourist destination. So Indonesia is home to many active volcanoes due to its position on the ring of fire or the circum pacific belt which is characterized by active volcanoes and frequent earthquakes. Other volcanoes in Indonesia are Mount Semero, Mount Bromo, Mount Sinabung and Mount Lee Levoto. The next topic is Gamusha or Gamcha. The hybrid Gamosa was used to felicitate guests in, in a function sparked protests across the Assam. Uh, that's why you have to read about this gamcha. The Assamese gamcha and Bengalis gamcha were cut in half and sewn together, which triggered rows in Assam claiming that the symbol of Assamese identity has been insulted. The gamosa or the gamcha is a hand woven rectangular cotton piece of cloth with red borders and designed uh, with different designs and motifs. It is traditionally offered to elders and guests as a mark of respect and honor by the Assamese people. It's an integral part of all social religious ceremonies in the state and is considered as an Assamist identity and pride. The gamosa literally means a towel and is commonly used in Assamese households for day-to-day -day affairs. For special purposes, it is also made of expensive materials like traditional Assamese pat silk in different colors as well. Gamosa is known as Pulam Gamosa, a gamosa meant for exchange during Bihu festival as Bihuan. Gamosa, uh, a unique scar found only in Assam, also received the geographic indication tag. Tibetan Buddhism. The Dalai Lama has named a US-born Mongolian boy as the 10th Khalkha Jetsun Dampa. It is the head of the Janang tradition of the Tibetan Buddhism. The 9th Khalkha Jetsun Dampa died in 2012 at Ulan Bator, Mongolia. Since then, there has been a wait for this reincarnation. Buddhism originated in India, became a predominant religion in Tibet by the 9th century AD. It evolved from Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions of Buddhism. This Jetsun Dampa, sorry, this uh, Janang tradition of Tibetan Buddhism uh, evolved from the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions of Buddhism, incorporating many tantric and sh shamanic traditions practices of both post Gupta period Buddhism in India. So Tibetan Buddhism also incorporates from the Bon religion which spread across the Tibet before this Buddhism's arrival. So Tibetan Buddhism has four major schools, Nyingma 8th century, Kagyu 11th century, Shakya 1073, Gelungs 1409. The Janang school uh, of 12th Century is one of the smaller schools. It grew as an offshoot of the Shakya school. Gelung school since 1640 has been predominant school of Tibetan Buddhism. The Dalai Lama belongs to this Gelung school. The Dalai Lama is the foremost spiritual and temporal authority of Tibet. The fifth Grand Lama of the school 
Wang Lobsang Gyatso was first conferred the title of Dalai Lama. Dalai means ocean in Mongol. To consolidate his rule, he instituted the tradition of succession through reincarnation in the Gelung school. He himself claimed to be the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara, one of the most important bodhisattvas in Mahayana traditions. According to Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the spirit of a diseased Lama is reborn in a child. Several procedures are followed to recognize the Tuluks recognized uh, reincarnations. Over the past 70 years of Chinese occupation, he has been living in exile in Dharmashala of India. The next topic is Gorata Martyr Memorial. Uh, the Union Home Minister had inaugurated this Gorata Martyr Memorial and he hoisted the 103 feet high tricolor at Gorata Myron uh, in Bidar of Karnataka. Uh, so it is very very important uh, topic for your examination. Sardar Vallabhai Patel played a key role in Hyderabad liberation. The Hyderabad state was liberated from Nizam's rule on September 17, 1948. Gorata village in Bidar district of Karnataka was then a part of Nizam ruled Hyderabad state. The Hyderabad rulers opposed the erstwhile princely state's unification with India after India's independence. Razakar commander Shamshuddin had attacked Gorata village where the locals had hoisted a 2.5 feet tall national flag. The villagers had retaliated and killed Shamshuddin. Following this, May 9, 1948, at Gorata village, more than 200 people had been massacred with the Razakas of Nizam. So, thank you so much. We'll continue with the next part of the current affairs.